What untold stories and transformative ideas will the 25th Premier of Ontario share with us? I'm here with Kathleen Wynn. It's going to be awesome. So stay tuned. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, Lee. I'm truly appreciative to have this time with you. I would love, I mean, people know a lot about you. Do they know who you are? Maybe not really, but so much, you have always lived so authentically and led with such authenticity. And I wanted to begin with that about your journey. Well, thanks, Lee. And it is, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think you overstate my <laughs> my integrity, and but I but what I will say is that I have always tried. I've always tried to be who I am, you know. And um, when when in the political world we started talking about authenticity, um, I I hope that that's what people saw, you know. Um, because I didn't set out on a political career to be the premier. I didn't know that that was going to happen. I grew up north of uh, Toronto in Richmond Hill. Um, my dad was a small town G general practitioner. I have three sisters. I'm the eldest of three. Um, my mom was at home with us pretty much until she started to work when I was about 12 or 13. Um, and, you know, I, I did well in school. I was a runner. I... I was a joiner, like I, you know, I was always wanting to be involved. And I was in, I was interested in the politics of school um, early on. And I'm sure people have heard the story of in 1966, when I started high school, we weren't allowed to wear pants to school. And so we didn't think that was fair. And we got it changed. And we got it changed by, you know, I would go home, I'd get a note from my mom saying that I could wear pants to school, we'd, you know, go to school in pants, get kicked out go back, you know, so I, my activism started when I was about, I don't know, 13 or 14 years old, um, which seems, uh, it seems like that's a long time ago, but that, that core belief that um, you can change things that aren't fair in the world is what has driven me through my whole political career. So I hope, I hope that has come through. I believe so. I mean, having, had the privilege of working with you um, and seeing the journey that you have been on, I've always been like, that's Kathleen, you know? And even as we have those conversations, you've always been a good listener and you've always tried to reflect that back. Well, you know, I always believed that having people around me who were smarter than I am was a good idea. And you're <laughs> one of those. <laughs> Because it's, you know, no one person has all the answers. So listening to people is really important because the, the, um, the seeds of the answers to the issues that we're confronting are in those conversations with people in communities. And I remember when I ran for school trustee in 1994. So that was before my Karis was elected. It was before we had all the turmoil in the province around education and municipal provincial relations. And, um, I, I ran in 1994, I would knock on doors. There was a lot of homophobia. There was homophobia in every one of my campaigns. Yeah. During that campaign, there were people who would come to all candidates meetings, you know, with babies on their hips and, and proclaim that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't fit to be a school trustee. And so we dealt with that as a family. Um, but what I really learned from that 1994 campaign was that I loved knocking on people's doors and having conversations about important things. You know, there was no small talk. There was no, there was no kind of diversion. It was just like, I'm here because I want to, I want to be your trustee. And here's why education is so important. And, you know, can you talk to me about what's going on in your own kids' lives and, and how you see education? So that was, that was a joy to me. And that experience, even though I lost that election, by 72 votes. <laughs> That's a very small, it was very, close, it was very close, <laughs> very close. It, it gave me the, um, it gave me the motivation to continue, you know, like, okay, I can do this and I love it. And then the world blew up. My Karis was elected and we had a whole other fight on our hands. 
And you also fought back about that. We did. Yes, I did. We did. I worked with other activists, people like John Sewell. I can remember when uh, my friend Mary Rowe said to me, because I was starting a little group in North Toronto, because at that time we were living, um, and I did live in North Toronto for 40 years. Um, we started a little group called Concerned, Concerned Citizens of Ontario, because we were being, we were being, given $200 checks by the provincial government as though somehow that was going to mm. help anybody. Sounds like a tactic familiar. I know. <laughs> being employed know. now. And we were trying to figure out, this group of women and I were trying to figure out, well, what do we do with this $200, you know, to actually have an impact? And my friend Mary Rose said to me, you should call John Sewell, who was a former mayor of Toronto and kind of a folk hero of mine. You know, I really believed in him. He was uh, very avant-garde in the 70s and... Um, had a lot of a lot of strong visions for the city, I thought. Um, and she said, you should call John Sewell. And I said, he's not going to want to talk to me. Like what's, because I felt at that time, like I was on a different plane. You know, right. I was a mom. I had three kids. I was working part-time part as a conflict uh, mediator and working in the community, doing teacher training. But I wasn't on the, the provincial or national stage. And I just didn't think I was... Um, a big enough person, you know? I think like, we've all felt that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it was really important learning because I she got me John Sewell's number. I called him. He called me right back. And, you know, he's been a friend ever since. And that's an important lesson. And I've tried to say to people through my political career, um, just call him or her, you know, call them because they're just people. And, and in the same way, I encourage people to call me, you know, um, because the position sometimes masks the humanity. Yes. And so it was an important learning for me in 1995 or 96 that, that he was willing to work with me. And then we worked together in that pushback against the amalgamation of the city. We worked against the um, gutting of education funding. And then I started my own group called Metro, the Metro Parent Network. And that, that was kind of parallel with People for Education, which Annie Kidder started. Right. And it has gone on. It was the provincial organization. But I, I chose another path. I decided after um, Harris had been in office for a term that I was going to try to get elected into first the school board and then um, provincial government because I believed that I could do more and have more impact on the inside. Well, you certainly did get on the inside and started leading that change from it. Um, you know, we began working together when you were Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And I remember even during that time that people wanted the green belt in terms of access to it and unlocking that. So fast forward now to where we are today, and there's a big controversy and debacle of, of the green belt. And the current government is like, well, we need to build more housing. I'm curious about your thoughts about where could we build housing? Is the green belt the best and only way to meet the demands of the housing need? The green belt, opening the green belt and um, building on the green belt is the worst way to build housing because, uh, well, there are a number of reasons. The first one is there's enough land without it. And, you know, that's not just me talking. I mean, when, when we were running in 2018, I made that point to Doug Ford. We had studies that showed that there was a, enough land to build housing um, without opening the green belt. Um, the government's own advisor has told them that there's enough land. So there's been report after report that has said there is enough land. So here's how there's enough land. There's enough land that, that municipalities already have serviced for uh, for housing. So that would be greenfield building, right? But there's also enough land along transit corridors, along um, along uh, main streets and, and busy streets in cities and in communities where we can densify, you know, we can intensify the building yeah. and um, and we can we can look at different kinds of housing you know we can look at we can look at people who are overhoused having the ability to sell part of their house to um, a member of their family or yeah. somebody else who they want to live there so gentle intensification i think has been really highly underestimated um low rise uh, multi residential has been highly underestimated yeah. and 
So we need to look at all of those options. And those are the housing solutions that are going to, you know, they're going to provide the housing situations for young families and for single people who need them. But they're also going to make our communities livelier, more vibrant. And they're, it's going to be better for the environment. The trouble with opening up the green belt is that the green belt is the green belt for a reason. It's there not because Dalton McGinty, who I love and, you know, he was my boss and it was great and he made a really good decision, but he worked with environmentalists, he worked with experts to, to make sure that we put the green belt, we protected the land that was protecting the water, where water source um, was important, where there was biodiversity that was important, where there were wetlands that yeah. were significant. So, so the green belt is the green belt for a reason. And the, the reviews of the green belt should be about how do we put more land into protection? Because once you give away that land, once you pave it over, you don't get it back. Yeah. And so that's, that's my fundamental concern with what the government is doing now. There's a whole other political concern, and I don't know whether you want to talk about that, but <laughs> that is, that's the secondary concern. The first concern is that land is important. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that because there's a lot of, information out there that can rightly or wrongly that people are like, oh, well, this is good for this and that reason. And I think you are an expert having been the former minister and also having been the premier to know what is the vision for not just today, but tomorrow. Yeah. And I think densification is important because a lot of people who they need to get to work. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they need those services now. Otherwise, it's it's everyone's just driving. There's uh, there's such a ripple effect in that. Well, and you know, Lee, if you go to if you think about the the cities and the places that people go to because they love them, New York City or um, Rome or London or you know, New, I mean, the the cities that people um, travel to yeah. for vacations because they give them pleasure and they think yeah. they're great urban environments. They are not, well, they're big, but they're not sprawling suburban cities. You know, yeah. they are yeah. places where the population is living close together. Yeah. I lived in the Netherlands for three years. Yeah. And so I really got a taste of, um, of what transit can do for you, what cycling, how cycling can be so important yeah. and what um, very dense housing is like, you know, yeah. because people in the Netherlands, I lived in a place called Forburg, which is just, just outside the Hague. And we lived in a, a walk up, you know, um, my husband at the time and, and my babies and I were upstairs and on the third floor and below us. I mean, it was a row of, um, two story, three story housing. Yeah. And, Everybody lived that way. There yeah. were a few houses in places like Vassanar where, you know, there were bigger right. um, places, but everybody lived very close together. And they're even in the language, there are things like think of the neighbors, you know, Absolutely. which, you know, in our language doesn't even exist. But Ding on the Bureau and like you had to do that. You had to think yeah. about the neighbors because you're living close together and you have to pay attention to that. So. So we are out of step, I think, yeah. with most of the developed world yeah. in terms of what we expect, yeah. in terms of um, what housing is going to look like. And we have to we have to be more realistic. And I, you know, I lived in a pretty dense part of Toronto. I've lived in semis, uh, semi detached houses for most of my adult life. And we need we need more of that. Right. And it's the density. I, I agree with you. I live in East York in a semi and, you know, there's always these visions. Of, oh, it'd be great to have more space, but then we wouldn't have community. Then we wouldn't have be able to walk to school. That That's a big part of our life of walkability and going to the grocery store and walking or biking. And that really shifts transportation needs, timing needs. Like I'm not stuck on the highway or in gridlock for an hour. I mean, Absolutely. like there's a meme going around saying it takes an hour in Toronto to get to Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. So we have to think differently. I mean, here's another way we have to think differently. Um, there are municipalities in Ontario where you can't get permission to build an intergeneration, intergenerational house, you know? So if we talk about a semi or even a um, quadru quadruplex or whatever, yeah. um, if we want to 
densify and also deal with the issues around aging in place for many, yeah. many families. We need to think about what the zoning should be and what the permitting should be. You shouldn't have to pretend that you're putting in a, a summer kitchen or a spice kitchen just yeah. to get just to get your second kitchen in a, in a semi-detached house because that kind of intergenerational living is really important. And, you know, it is, it is not necessarily the North American white Anglo-Saxon way, yeah. right? Yeah. And so that's something that we have to come to grips with is that we have, we have to look at what other cultures have done and we have to be imaginative about how we can not necessarily try to emulate another uh, another society but look at our own communities and what's best for the people living in them and change the laws and change the permitting processes to allow those things so how do we do that though kathleen well i you know it, it's happening. I actually yeah. believe it's happening. Um, during the uh, the last municipal election and during the mayoralty race, there was a lot of talk about how do we get that missing middle? How yeah. do we how do we make sure that we do change some of those rules? Because it's not it's not all about building new houses with yeah. you know two acres of property outside of uh, outside of downtown Toronto. And so I think it is starting to happen, but. It has to be something that people talk to with their counselors. Yes. And then, because that's where it starts. I really believe it starts municipally. Yeah. And then the push goes to the provincial government because when the municipalities are ready to take those things on, you know, we know when we were in um, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, we were still at the point where there were some municipalities that shall remain nameless, yes. just on the outskirts of Toronto, who didn't want to have second suites, you yes. know, who didn't want to accept yes. that you could have um, a small apartment attached yes. to, uh, or, or have somebody living in your basement and that would be okay. And I think we're getting past that, but we're not all the way yet. So it has yeah. to start at the community level and people have to say, what are the solutions that we can find right here? And I think that's really a good point that there is a groundswell of people saying, no, we got to think smarter about how we do this and reach your counselor. Like that's what municipal politics is about, right? And I think a lot of people don't even realize the political arm of that. Like, I have an issue. Who do I talk to? And they reach out to whoever's there, but municipal counselors deal with the day-to-day -day of your living, right? And and then that will build up. Yeah. And, you know, I have a lot of challenges um, accepting what this current provincial government has done. One of them is something they did early on. Doug Ford cut the number of councillors in Toronto right. in half. Mm -hmm. And that waters down. It dilutes the uh, representation that councillors can um, do of their constituents' concerns. But I still know that even though there are fewer councillors, mm -hmm. they work very hard. They have very smart staff. And so people should not worry about reaching out to them and, and expressing their ideas, go to their public meetings, you know. And I think right now, because the green belt and housing are such hot issues yeah. that people, if they can, need to speak up and and really say what they think about what needs to happen. And I know there will be controversies, yeah. but there are lots of people in our city who, I say our city, I live in Alliston now, but it still feels like our city. Yeah, this, is, oh, this is my home. Um, there are lots of people in Toronto who know that things have to change yeah. and really want to see them change. Yeah. And I, I, you're totally right on that. And I think people just need to know how to start activating that change. And that mm -hmm. starts with attending public meetings, expressing it. I think one of the things, most of the people um, who I think might be most directly impacted by housing may not have access to their time or transportation because many people are newcomers mm -hmm. or many people are working multiple jobs just to make ends meet. And that is always the classic conundrum yeah. of how people can advocate for themselves because it takes time to advocate. And if you don't see a direct correlation of, I put a call in or I spoke with this person versus I could have spent that hour working, getting probably minimum wage or just slightly above, and, and that balance mm -hmm. of personal survival versus let me help advocate for that. 
Yeah, and that's always a conundrum in people's lives, right? Um, some of the strongest advocates I've known in my life, in yeah. my career, have been people who have lots of challenges in their lives, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think of a person like Pat Moore, who was a, a tenant advocate in Thorncliffe Park. Um, I met her in 2002 when I was campaigning to be the candidate, actually, um, for the Liberals. And then I won the election in 2003. Um, Pat didn't have a lot of money. She lived in co-op housing in Thorncliffe okay. Park. And, and she, you know... She had that fire in her belly and not everybody's going to have that. You yeah. know, I think, I think it's unrealistic for us to expect everybody to be a community yeah. organizer and everybody yeah. to be, to put their name on a ballot. That's just not how it works. But if there is someone in your community who's trying to organize and is trying to raise their voice, I think what people can do is support that person. Yes. You know, yeah. and the supporters are, they're everything. Because that that person may be a leader, yeah. but if they don't have anybody following them, if they don't have anybody around them, yeah. then nothing's going to happen. So I just think yeah. I think we need to um, be realistic about what people can do. Yeah, I always you know I always think about um, all the different organizations I've worked in throughout my life. You know, whether it was from high school or community organizations that I worked in. Jane and I were. Um, or I was on the board of Lesbian Gay Bi Youth Line, for example. Like there are so many organizations I've been part of. And in every single one, whether it's a church or a community organization or a political party, there's going to be a core of people who do a lot of the hard work and the heavy lifting. You know, mm -hmm. you, you know, being part of any campaign, yeah, there's a core of people who do that work. And we need to not get discouraged about that. That is human nature. There's yeah. going to be a core of people. There are going to be people who come in every day, you know, the Maryland beaches of the world, yes. you know, who ran my campaign office every single time. She, she went way above and beyond what yeah. other people did. And she did that because she believed in it. You know, she yeah. believed in the work she was doing. And so, so I think we shouldn't get caught up. I'm making a general point here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We shouldn't get too discouraged by the notion that there, you know, there are only a few people who have the ability right. to, to do that kind of work and put in that kind of commitment. That's okay. As long as the rest of us follow in, right? You know, yes. and join in. Yeah. And I think that's a really great point because we have to work within the realm of reality and where we can be supportive is supporting the leaders who are trying to do that work. So that's a great point. Um, and can I just say one more thing about yeah. that? I think one of the things that uh, is a threat to that right now is social media, because I believe that a lot of people think that if they just send out a tweet or they post an Instagram post or they whatever, that they've done something. And yes. maybe they have, maybe they have, maybe they've motivated somebody else. But if, if all that happens is there's a conversation among like-minded people and there's no there's no debate or there's no yes. discussion and there's no real life application, then I think we're, we're losing opportunities. And so that translation of, okay, we're going to talk to ourselves here on social yeah. media into the world is it, that's one we haven't perfected yet. No. And I think that's actually a really good point because people are just like on their screens a lot of the times. And they think that if I like or share or change my banner on your facial profile, like that I've, I've stood for something, mm -hmm. but we need to connect that dot to say, no, it has to extend into showing up in other ways. Um, even voting, you know, yes. I mean, voter turnout is so terrible and yet we've got people chattering on, um, social media all the time. So what's the disconnect? Why are people doing that one thing? And that's not translating into going to the ballot box because our democracy depends on that, right? Well, the word democracy, where do we have healthy conversations and debates and not just side with the people who we are already, you know, it's an echo chamber and it's, I agree with you. I agree with you. Great. But we actually need to have that healthy. I disagree with you. Here's why, mm -hmm. because it actually creates thought, critical thinking and, and an opportunity for democracy to unfold. And I, I, I'm finding when I see people have debates, it's just like a total shutdown. Right. 
or right. total, yay, you're the best. Like, it's just polarized. Yeah. And I'm like, where's that medium to say, I disagree with you for this instead of just writing someone off or ghosting them? Yeah. And, you know, Lee, one of the one of the questions I was asked a lot um, in my time. So I was in the legislature from 2003 to 2022. And um, I was asked a lot about, well, what's the point of question period and what's the point of debate, you know, and. Honestly, sometimes in the middle of my career, before I was premier, um, I would think, yeah, oh God, the debate goes on forever. And question period is not question. It, it's question period. It's not answer period. You know, there wasn't, the, you know. Yeah. But I have to say, I think today that it's even more important that we have parliament. And we have the House of Commons. We have the legislatures across the country. Because at least there, there are rules around what, happens there is a relatively civil debate you know yeah. there's still things you can't st you can't say in uh the legislature you you have to give your time you have to give time to the opposition and so those those contrary views have to come out yeah. and so thank goodness that we have that because as you say where do we get together to talk about our democracy um the town square is not there anymore, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, I used to laugh because there was a group of Greek men who would meet at the Thorncliffe Park, um, the mall. Yes, yes, yes. I, the East, 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 I can't even remember what it's called, but I just called it the Thorn, Thorncliffe Park Mall. Um, and they would, they would sit every morning and talk about, you know, the world and solve the problems of the world. And I would joke with them, have you solved all the problems yet? <laughs> but that's a small group of people, you yeah. know? And, uh, you know, where are the other places? So yeah. people go to playgrounds with their kids. Everybody doesn't go to a religious institution anymore. Yeah. So, you know, where that might have been a place that people gathered. Um, they're online. They're not going to offices. I mean, this is another part of the post-COVID world. There are people who aren't even going to their offices. So yeah. they're not even going to their workplace in order to have those discussions. So we're losing those places. And yes. I think we have to we have to be careful that we preserve the ones that still exist. I know, and that's dwindling in so many ways. And I'm just thinking about what you're saying right now about those town halls and those spaces and creating that like people are out of practice with social, even basic social etiquette mm -hmm. in a post COVID world. Like I feel like I'm observing people's tempers flare up or people are like, you know, like social graces aren't there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what is happening? Right. And I think as people work from home and they're just more and more insular and in their own echo chamber, that that's dangerous. Well, I think people are very grumpy. I think you're right. Grumpy. People are very yeah. grumpy right now. Um, you know, they're grumpy for good reasons. Um, the isolation is part of it. I think we I think we've underestimated the impact of COVID mm -hmm. on families, on individuals, on kids. Yeah. Um, teachers will tell you that they're still dealing with uh, yeah. with the impacts of the isolation. Um, but they're also grumpy because uh, the economy's tough right now, yeah. you know? The two things that um, I find young people, you know, your age and, and Thank you. younger, like, yeah. <laughs> Thank your age and younger, but um, the cost of groceries mm -hmm. and the fact that they're going to have to renegotiate their mortgages yeah. in this higher interest rate world. Like those are constant, constant concerns for people uh, your age. The effects of climate change, I don't, I don't care if you're a climate change denier or not. If you watch the fires that are raging yes. or have raged this summer, um, you listen to the stories about flooding and uh, environmental degradation, it's, it's scary, you know? And whatever your ideology is, it's scary because you're watching people having to flee from their homes, be evacuated because the country's burning. So... I think there are lots of reasons that people are grumpy. And what we need to do is we need to be honest about what the solutions are. You know, what really needs to happen quickly. We're not going to stop climate change. I get that. We're not going to arrest it. But let's not lie to ourselves about what we're doing being helpful or not, you know. Mm. And, and the fact that young people are struggling with the cost of groceries, that, they, that they're worried about the... Um, uh, the renegotiation of their mortgages. 
Well, let's have an honest conversation about what has to happen there. I don't think it's a bad thing, actually, that um, three premiers in the country said to the Bank of Canada, you can't raise the rates again. You yeah. know? I mean, we can call it interference. It wasn't because they were just expressing their yeah. constituents' views. But, you know, we need to, we need to be realistic yeah. about what people are facing. So that, you know, it's, it, what I'm saying there is it's not surprising that people are grumpy. And then to add on top of that, there are a lot of people my age in the world. You know, I'm a baby boomer. And you know why baby boomers are grumpy? Because they're 70 and older. <laughs> and they, they, they think they've run the world yeah. since well, 1946. <laughs> yeah. And now they're not. And, you know, too bad for us, right? Like we just got to get a grip. But um, but I think there is that so that we see more old people around who are having mobility issues yeah. and the healthcare system is kind of strained because of all of us. So that kind of casts a pall on our communities too, I think. That's, yes, that's definitely something to think about. Um, you are, you know, I just, I want to go in this direction of, the fire in your belly <laughs> and inspiring younger people, right? And the fact that your pathway to become premier wasn't, I, you didn't expect to become premier. You became, you were passionate about the issue that was at hand and figuring out what that solution would be, reaching out to people that was, people that you thought was outside of your um, sphere, but realizing that that can actually help be, be the activator of change. And so for a lot of young people who probably during COVID were isolated and they're left to their own vices and may not be aware of the opportunities out there. What is advice that you would give to someone? So what I, what I say to young people always when I'm asked this question is, first of all, get involved in something you care about. Mm. You know, um, for me, the motivator was education. Publicly funded education, I believe, is the cornerstone of our democracy. It's so important. And it was under threat in 1995 when Mike Harris was elected. So that's what got me involved. Um, but it can be anything, you know. There's so many issues that we have to deal with, whether they're environmental issues, whether they are um, economic issues, you know, there's so many things to care about. And what I, what I believe about people in my, you know, my 70 years, people care about things, you know, yeah. they care. It may be about the, the pavement in front of their street, you know, yeah. but that can be a window into how government works, how decisions are made, how you bring about change. And so I say to young kids, get involved in something that you care about at school. It's because it can start there, you know, and nothing's too small. So if you want to, if you want to start a club that's interested in saving turtles, or if you yeah. want to start a club, that's a drama club. It doesn't really matter. Get involved in something that you care about and then watch for the doors to open. And if you, if you at a point in your life feel like, I don't know who to talk to, or I, you know, I want to go to the next step and I can't figure out what that is, then look around you and see who's the person who cares most about the thing I care about right, right, and right. talk to them. Yeah. Right. Cause they'll, they'll have an idea because they know different people. They may be older than you and they can then, they can give you some suggestions. And even in that conversation where that person may be giving you suggestions, maybe you don't want it. So for example, I teach a course at U of T, public policy course to first year students in, uh, the, in one term and fourth year students in the second term. And what I, what I often I'm asked is how do I get involved in politics? You know? And so what I will say is, well, the best way to do that is to volunteer with a politician or to work on a campaign yeah. because then you get to understand how it works. Yes. Right. And in those conversations, sometimes I can tell the person really doesn't want to get involved in a campaign, but that's okay because we've had a conversation and that person then can rule that out, you know? Right. And then we can have the next conversation. Well, okay, then maybe you're interested in a, per in a particular po a policy area. So maybe you're in, in, um, maybe you're interested in developmental services. So, you know, helping kids with developmental delays or developmental issues, then here's somebody I can, yeah. help you to talk to. So I think 
it is really about, it's not about formal mentorship necessarily, yeah. but it's about just asking that question, you know, and being, being, um, open to having uh, a discussion that, that may lead somewhere and it may not, but that's okay. It's like, um, there's, there's a quote that someone once said, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Mm-hmm. So have a conversation. One person might not lead somewhere, but keep going until you finally someone, something does open. You know, it's like, um, it's like when kids ask me about jobs, you know, yeah. what are, what are the jobs? What did you do before being premier to become premier? Well, I worked in a factory. I was a waitress. <laughs> I taught swimming. I, um, you know, I, I worked for a, a community newspaper selling classified ads. None of those things yeah. sound like you're on a path to being premier. But honestly, those were things that prepared me for my life. You know, yes. I worked at a theater in, uh, in Richmond Hill. That was one of my first jobs. Um, and I made popcorn and I made change, but I dealt with the public. Yes. Right. And I got to understand who came to who came to the movies on Christmas Day, you know, and why that was an important thing that the movie theater be open on Christmas Day, right? So, so you the experiences you have may not be a direct path to where you think you want to go, but honestly, where you think you want to go may be where you may not be where you end up, you know. Absolutely. When I walked into the Odeon Theater and applied for that job in nineteen, I don't know, sixty nine or 1970, there was no thought of being premier in my head. Yeah. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. when I worked in a bookstore, uh, the year I took off after high school, I worked at King and Young at WH Smith books. I didn't think I was going to be premier. I was trying to figure out whether I was going to go to university, yeah. you know? So, um, it, those, those experiences are really, really important. And having a diversity of those experiences is even more important. I value that so much because I feel like there's a lot of people who I've met recently who are like, oh, but I don't want my kid to go to work. They should just focus on school. Like just focus on that one thing so you do really, really well at it. And I'm like, wow, that's really interesting because when I was growing up, I didn't necessarily have that privilege. And I also didn't want to have a huge uh, loan over my head that I worked while I went to school and I worked as much as I could. And it actually taught me the most important skill timetabling, blocking out my mm-hmm. schedule. And I made my schedule compressed. So I was in university for like three full days, like yeah. in 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. But it meant I could work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right. Monday. Right. And that ethic, like that was from university, that that is a part of what led me to, oh, yeah, I can do that. Let me just move this around and, and figure it out and and ask those like questions of, can we shift that so it could work within my schedule? Because I had a vision of I need to work because mm-hmm. I needed I, it was a minimum wage job. I mean, it was like six eighty yeah. five, but I worked as many hours as I could, and it taught me scheduling. Yeah, <laughs> project well, management. And, and you know what? We we sh- we just should not underestimate those skills. I mean, it is so important. And I I was really aware during the beginning of COVID when we were banging pots and, you know, yes, we were pens for uh, nurses, thanking, you know. yeah, for the nurses and the grocery workers and so on. Um, those jobs are what make our world work, right? So if as a, a person growing up, Um, and starting to make their way in the world. If we have no knowledge of those jobs, and if we don't know that maybe, maybe one of those jobs is what we want to do, then we're missing huge opportunities, you know, and we're missing huge opportunities in like a career path, but also we're missing huge opportunities in terms of building knowledge of how the world works. So I, you know, I just, I encourage, I used to have to encourage a lot of families when I was a politician to let their kids, for example, take co-op courses, right? So that not necessarily are you going to be a woodworker or not necessarily are you going to work in this industry, but you're going to find out, your child is going to find out whether they like it or not. You know, if they think they want to work in the fashion industry, then let them try it and see if they like it and see how hard it is. Cause it looks pretty glam yeah. from the outside, Absolutely, but it's not. So, you know, broadening your horizons and um, having those experiences is just, 
it's such a gift and it's so important. Absolutely. I, I think that's so wise. Um, so that's what I would say to a young person. Thanks to start. No, no. I what do you care about? That's yeah. Really, well, I mean, okay. For people who, so what about for people who are parents, moms, you know, like with full busy lives, you know, the term that's like, oh, we're always trying to find work-life balance. So, <laughs> so the truth on that, <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm not the right person to talk about. <laughs> but I don't know if that's actually really a bill of goods because I don't actually think that's achievable. Yeah. That's, that, that's my lens in it because there's so much that you have to do. How, well, do, you how do you manage that? Maybe it's the management of that. Yeah. Because I think the reality is most people work very hard and are, are feel like I should be doing nine to five, come home, cook, clean, prepare all these foods. And it's not realistic. Right. So underlying that question of work-life balance is how do I have a perfect life? Right. Yeah. How do I... How do I make sure that I do everything in my career that I can to advance? How do I make sure that I look great every day? How do I make sure that my children all have every moment of me that they need? And as you say, that there's a beautiful meal on the table at six o'clock. It's a fantasy. Yeah, it's a fantasy. And so, um, you know, I'm kind of a malcontent. Uh, my partner, Jane, will say, you know, you're happy one minute and then all of a sudden you're just a bear. Like what? <laughs> well, I may have listened to a news report or yeah. who knows, but life is full of ups and downs, you know, and I don't think I've had a day in my life where I've gotten up in the morning and everything's been just la di da perfect the whole day. It just doesn't work like that. If you have that life, I'm happy for you, but it's not my, it's not my experience. So what I say about um, life work balance is that we do our best, yeah. you know, you do your best. It's like the concept of good enough mothering. Yeah. Right. Um, I remember when my kids were little, I would go to play groups and there was a, there was often a competitiveness about, um, you know, how much sugar our kids were or weren't oh, eating yes, or, you yes, know, yes, what yes. activities they were or weren't in, you know, and how they were getting ahead. And, um, and I, it took a toll on me, you know, and I, I put my kids, they will tell you, I didn't give them enough sugar in their lives. They had to rely <laughs> on their dad for that because I was trying to be perfect, you know, right. and I had to, I had to give that up. Um, I don't think I gave it up soon enough because it, it created a lot of anxiety for me. And so I, I hope young moms and dads and parents, um, really focus on what's important with their kids, you know, and listen to them and spend time with them. And if they go to school with a spot on their clothes or if not everything doesn't match, you know, I did get over that. I didn't okay. worry about the matching <laughs> clothes because because <laughs> who cares really? It's not life threatening, right? Yeah. Um, and if they're five minutes late for work or whatever, you know, it's like, it's like on each side, there has to be some give. And yeah. I think it's really healthy that the current generation of young parents and COVID has helped this actually, this is a good thing. Um, I think they are clearer about um, how important their families are. And I think, yeah. cause in that life work imbalance, what always lost was the family, right? Yeah. And so if we can get to a place where families get a bit more yeah. of the time that they need and the workplace maybe is going to get a bit less, but the work gets done, then we're probably on the right track. But perfection is a long way off. I don't even think it's achievable. I agree with you. And, and also I think maybe that is one of the things about COVID was people were like, wait, I'm home. I, I can work from home. I can do this, spend time with my family put a load of laundry on yeah. and then get to the meeting. Um, there's a productivity and a sort of like a satisfaction. I'm like, okay, I've, I've met a lot of different needs. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, it's kind of a lot, which is why people don't really want to be doing that long commute and, and going into the office. Yeah. And then on the flip side, it's also the commodity, the conversations that can help. So I think we're in an interesting time. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think you and I have to be aware we're talking we're talking very much with a middle class affluent lens because yeah. for some families, this is just a ridiculous conversation. What are you talking about work-life balance, yeah. right? Like I'm hanging on by my fingernails to even put food on the table, 
make sure my kids even get to school in the morning, yeah. you know, and that I have a job. So, yeah. you know, we have to it's be, true. we have to be aware of that. And, um, yeah, I just, I just think it's important that we not lose sight of the fact that it's a privilege to even have that conversation. It, it 100% is, um, one of, let, let me, let me take it to this question of community building. When we talked about if there's leader in there to get supporters to support it, what do you think are the ingredients we need for building community? You've been such a great community builder. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I think the uh, we've talked about some of the components. You yeah. know, we've talked about listening to people. Yeah, um, we've talked about. Uh, believing that problems can be solved yeah, and they can be little problems. Like I'll give you an example. When my youngest, so I've got three kids. And when my youngest was in um, junior kindergarten, I think she was at a school different from the school that my older two had been at and they didn't have a T-ball league and they right. didn't have a cross country team. And so, um, you know, I said to my kid's dad, I think you should start the T-ball team and I'll do the cross country. <laughs> So, so, um, and those seem like little things, but it meant that, you know, the T-ball league got started because Phil kind of gathered some family members around and, and they started the T-ball league and I would go out a couple of mornings a week and we'd run cross country and it meant the kids with a teacher support yeah. and the kids got to go to, um, they got to go to the, the cross country meets. And so what happened was the kids got to know each other in a different context than in the classroom. And this was a school where the kids were bust because it was a, a French immersion school. So they didn't have the same kind of community that right. builds up when you're walking to school. Um, and the parents got to know each other differently, right? Yeah. So we were building community because of that shared experience of our kids taking part in, in that sport. And again, it's a small example, yeah. but it starts with, is there a problem here that we have the capacity to solve? Are there some other people who we can bring in to help us solve it? It doesn't have to be a contentious political issue. It can just be like, let's, let's see if we can fix this. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't, you know, yeah. sometimes you can solve a thing. Sometimes you can't, but, um, but again, being willing to either be the person who puts up their hand and says, I'll, I'll take this on or being willing to be the support person is it's that's the starting point right of of community building and i think i think that um that's kind of at the core of community building no matter what issue we're talking about you know we can be talking about a national issue like childcare yeah. and it starts with families saying this is a problem that needs to be solved how are we going to solve it coming up with solutions locally and then extrapolating those nationally. Right. So um, that's, that's how I see community building when it comes to politicians. Um, I think that there's a responsibility on the part of politicians to do community development work, you know, to create places yeah. where people can be, yeah. where they can do that kind of problem solving. Cause we can't assume that people are going to sit in their own spaces and come up with a bright idea to solve every problem. That's not realistic and it's not fair. So politicians who have already said, I, I am signing up to be a leader in this community. It's res the responsibility of those politicians to create places where people can come together and solve problems and listen to each other. And one of the problems with what's happening in this current government is that, and I experienced it because I was an MPP through 2018 to 2022, these are politicians who run away from those community spaces. They only want to go places where they're going to be reinforced and validated. And that's not the job. The job is to go where there may be a disagreement, where there may be an argument and deal with it. Well, take, you just said something that popped in my mind. It's about you would always walk into spaces and if there's a problem, you never were afraid to face that. You were never afraid to ask mm -hmm. those questions or to listen. I mean, I remember we would go to certain events. You would walk around the room until every single person had been heard. And I was like, wow. And people would come up to me as your support staff and be like, 
she's listening to us. Mm -hmm. And that would always bring the temperature down because people want to be heard. I remember um, when the youth walked from, uh, where, uh, not, it wasn't from Attawapiskat, but they- Grassy Narrows. Grassy Narrows, and they mm -hmm. walked across. They set up um, effigies and, and, and uh, dinner plates, like a dinner table setting with all the different MPPs. You were the only, you were not the premier at that point, but you came out mm -hmm. knowing people were not happy with you as a minister of yeah. Aboriginal affairs. And you were, people were like, no, don't go, don't go. And you're like, they have walked yeah. this distance and I'm going to give them this time. Exactly. So th this is a really important point, Lee, um, that you're making because we do not increase our humanity, solve problems, come together if we don't face conflict. Yeah. There's no way, there's absolutely no way that we can be better as a country or as a province or even as an individual if we don't face the conflicts that, that we are dealing with, you know? And so I felt very strong. And maybe it was because I had spent a decade being a mediator. Yeah. I had trained as a, as a mediator. Um, you know, I, I'd done a number of different trainings. Um, I worked as a community mediator. So I worked in organizations that were in conflict. I worked with families that were in conflict. And I worked in schools where we were trying to lower the temperature on the schoolyard and give kids some skills to yeah. deal with conflict. And part of Part of that for me was healing my own inflammatory um, inflammatory personality, you know, because I'd spent a lot of time in conflict. Yeah. I, that's that's who I was as a young person. I was I was mad a lot of the time because there's a lot to be mad about. <laughs> but I had to find a way to deal with that. And the conflict resolution training, the mediation training really helped me. And it helped me not be afraid of conflict. I already wasn't too afraid of conflict because... Um, there'd been a lot of yelling in my house when I was growing up. So I knew you weren't going to die yeah, if, you, yeah. <laughs> if somebody yelled at you, but, but it was, um, I learned to be more constructive in the way that I walked into conflict. And so, well, you know, I always had discussions with my detail about going into, into protests, yeah. right? Because I felt really strongly having been a protester during the Mike Harris years, I felt really strongly that it was important for me to, talk to people, yeah. whether it was the kids from Grassy Narrows, whether it was the um, young people from Black Lives Matter who walked up from City Hall to Queens Park. It was really important for me to hear what they had to say and see what we could, where we could find some meaning together, you know? Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the most important jobs of politicians is to listen to people who don't agree with us and figure out how we live together. Because it's never going away. Yeah. I remember um, when I first started going into schools and doing conflict resolution work in playgrounds and so on, you know, there would be teachers who would say, we want to get rid of conflict in the playground. Great. Well, then you're going to have to go to a different planet because yeah. there's <laughs> always going to be conflict. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. how we deal with it. That's important. Yeah. I love that. And I really appreciate that because I think that resolve that I always saw your grit to like, we're going to listen. Yeah. And that just, I would see that de-escalate. And I learned so much from observing you and how you dealt with it to say, that doesn't scare me. Okay, what, what's the issue? Right, right. You know? Yeah. Um, well, okay, so I wanted to bring this, wrap this up with an invitation of, is there anything that you would like? I'm going to end with your quote that you picked, but we've talked so much and we can talk about so many other things, but is there anything that you would like to like talk about? What I just want to say is I, I have loved this conversation. It's been a real privilege. And I think it's so interesting and important that you are doing this Thank you. and um, that your generation sees the importance of and validates the experience of the people around you. Um, because just by, just by having me here to talk with you, you're giving me an opportunity to think through my life, you know, and to share my experiences. I, um, I'm trying to think of myself as a crone, okay. C-R-O-N-E, which can mean horrible old woman, but it can also mean wise old woman, you know? Wise old woman, and so sure. I'm trying to reclaim crone. And it's not that I have wisdom that is unique or special, but I've had a different life experience than a 70 year old sitting next to me. And so 
You know, if you can benefit and if the people who are listening can benefit in some small way, that's fantastic. So I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity. Well, no, thank you for sharing your wisdom and knowledge, because I know so many of the people who do listen are people who are interested in, in doing more, doing better. And so it is really a privilege to share that story that you have walked on uh, you. with me. So I always love to end with a quote. And so the quote that you have for today, yes. um, <laughs> yeah, you asked me my favorite quote and maybe a different quote tomorrow, but yeah. But the quote that you have for today is I'm a firm believer in women in their ability to do things and in their influence and power. Women set the standards for the world and it is for us women of Canada to set the standards high by Nellie McClung. Yeah. I believe it firmly and, um, you know, it's how I've tried to live. It shows. Thank, Thank you. you, Kathleen. Thanks, Lee.